Today we begin the season of Advent. The word Advent means simply coming, for we are preparing for the coming of the Christ Child at Christmas. At this time of year, we recall that all of human history finds its meaning in Jesus Christ. God communicated his truth to mankind gradually, by stages, according to humanity's ability and readiness to receive God's saving truth. To dramatize and symbolize this biblical pattern of preparation for Christ, we shall set the nativity scene step by step during Advent, adding figures each Sunday. The wooden stable, made from a child's cradle, symbolizes for us the state of humanity, the house of mankind, at a particular stage of God's plan. In the words of today's parable, the master of the house, the Lord God himself, came at last, in Jesus Christ, unto his own, and was born of Mary. Our Redeemer calls us now to watchfulness and prayer, so that the grace of the Christ child may come into our hearts and lives, and so prepare us for the true King's coming in glory at the end of time. On this day, we see the wooden structure of the stable empty of any human presence. That symbolizes the world after the fall of Adam and Eve. The house of mankind was left desolate, like a darkened and empty shrine, for the grace of God was rejected. The ox and the ass represent the rest of the created world, deprived of faithful human stewardship. This scene reminds us also of Noah and his ark, in which his family and other living things were saved from the waters of the flood. The Lord had said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark. I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark, to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female." The ark itself is described almost as a floating Garden of Eden, or temple. This is suggested by the detail that the ark is built on three levels, like the much later temple in Jerusalem. At the end of the flood, the ark rests on Mount Ararat, on a sacred height, like a temple. God commanded the construction of Noah's Ark just as he commanded the construction of the tabernacle in the time of Moses. Noah's Ark and Moses' tabernacle were both mobile shrines. That means that the Ark is a sacred place, upon which the salvation of the human race depended. So also, in an infinitely higher way, is our Savior's cradle in Bethlehem. When the waters had subsided, Noah went forth and built an altar and offered sacrifice to God. This follows the biblical pattern in two ways. God saves the many through a particular chosen man who gathers a faithful few around him and renews the covenant. Through that faithful remnant comes salvation, whether the rest of the world is aware of it or not. Noah is himself almost an Adam figure. To him and his family, God gives the same command as to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, so as to extend God's covenant family. Both Noah and Adam are what we call types, or symbolic previews of Christ. Adam is the head of the human race, in whom humanity is fallen. Christ is the new Adam, in whom humanity is redeemed and restored. Thus St. Paul writes to the Romans, As by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. The same pattern holds for Noah. Through the one righteous man, Noah, his family is saved 
from the flood. In a similar way, we are saved by Jesus Christ, the beloved Son of God. The ark itself is an image of the Holy Catholic Church. To be saved, we must remain in God's church, in God's family, the one ark of salvation. We must pass through the cleansing waters of baptism. As St. Peter says, recalling the story of Noah, baptism now saves you through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the Christmas carol, Hark the herald angels sing, we proclaim that Christ was born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Of the person of Christ, the Catechism of the Catholic Church tells us, we believe and confess that Jesus of Nazareth, born a Jew, of a daughter of Israel, at Bethlehem, at the time of King Herod the Great and the Emperor Augustus, is the eternal Son of God made man. He came from God, descended from heaven, and came in the flesh. This mystery of God becoming man in Christ is called the Incarnation, His becoming flesh. As the Catechism tells us, He became truly man while remaining truly God. Jesus Christ is true God and true man. He is truly the Son of God, who without ceasing to be God and Lord, became a man and our brother. So, to the question, who is Jesus Christ? The answer is that he is the second person of the Trinity, the eternal Son of the Father, the eternal Word of God, through whom all things were made. To the question, what is Christ? The answer is that he is both divine and human, true God and true man. Jesus Christ is one divine person in two natures, divine and human. The name Jesus means God saves, for he delivers us from sin and death and from the power of Satan. The word Christ means anointed one, the true king and the eternal high priest. This question, who and what Christ is, is the key to the doctrine of the atonement effected by our Savior on the cross. If you look at the word atonement, it is really at one meant, that is, the making one, reuniting of those who were separated and estranged. Atonement means reconciliation, the restoration of a right and peaceful relationship. Atonement also includes the idea of making amends, of repairing damage, of doing penance. So the word atonement can be expressed in plain English as making up. If two persons have quarreled, and are then reconciled, and peace is restored, we say they made up. If you or I do something wrong, and feel sorry for that, you or I need to make up for the harm that was done. We try to make it right, as far as we can. Christ's atonement, accomplished on the cross, does that perfectly for all mankind. The Incarnation makes that atonement possible. We come in faith, to the wood of our Savior's cradle, which leads us to the wood of his cross. Christ not only makes atonement, he is the atonement, the divine and human bridge between the holy God and fallen mankind. As St. John tells us, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, and from his fullness have we all received grace upon grace.